Um, so we wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about our model, talk a little bit about where we've been, where we're going, obviously how we work with candidates, and a little bit about our history and really go a little bit deeper than we might in a shorter conversation or in passing in the halls, um, but to really get, give a sense to you of how we approach things as an organization, some of our decision making, some of our strategic thinking, and then also hear back from you. Um, and really, we're hoping that this is a conversation. So what we wanted to do is start um, by just taking some questions. We're going to write down some of the questions that you have, and then we'll structure the conversation around some of the questions that we're hearing from the room. So does anyone have questions for us? Um, do, you, do you work with uh, candidates who um, only have to really face a um, competitive primary? I'm very curious about the um, Catch-22 that is funding for progressive campaigns, especially if a large part of that is about um, fighting big money in politics. And one of the things being um, who to accept money from. Um, how you guys decide specifically which races you are going to prioritize. Um, I was wondering how uh, we can continue to coordinate efforts with, ca uh, with campaigns and candidates um, that are in uh, the similar states and similar situations, so that way we can not only win as individual candidates, but continue to win together. And I see some uh, some common themes emerging. Oh, should um, we start with the origin story? So, yeah. Okay, we'll start with the origin story. <laughs> um, so Adam and I formed uh, P-TRIP in January of 2009. Uh, right after Obama had been elected, we formed with zero members, zero money. Nothing. We worked for the organization for eight months for free um, as volunteers while we got it off the ground. Uh, we started paying our first employee before we started paying ourselves um, because we felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, so why did we form it? Why did we do this? Why did we you know, make a personal sacrifice to make this happen? Um, I think that it's useful to hear both of our individual backgrounds and the stories that brought us to this place. Um, for me, I was a union organizer for a number of years in Appalachia, um, and I organized hospital workers, in, uh, especially in West Virginia. I spent about 14 months organizing a hospital wall-to-wall -wall in Green, West Virginia. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, I rem and I had this, what I call my road to Damascus moment, uh, where this must have been 2004, I was um, driving back. I just spent four months organizing a Head Start in Clarksburg, West Virginia. It was a 43-person shop. Uh, the employers had fought it every step of the way. Um, we won by two votes, you know, blood, sweat, and tears for this 43-person shop. And I was driving from the vote count to the victory party, and I was listening to the radio, and a story came on the radio that uh, George W. Bush, who was president at the time, had just signed the executive order stripping collective bargaining rights from 17,000 federal screeners. And I realized that I could keep doing what I was doing. I could keep trying to organize workers through NLRB elections, one shop at a time, and I didn't have enough years, like I didn't have enough of a lifetime in order to undo what George W. Bush had just done with one stroke of his pen. And I realized that what I needed to do was change who held power. And I needed to change the people who were wielding that pen and who were making those decisions because that impacts everything. That impacts environment, that impacts labor, that impacts inf the education, that impacts women's rights, that impacts everything. So we need to change who holds power. And so I moved to Washington, D.C. with two suitcases, nothing else, didn't know anyone here. Um, with this idea that I was going to learn how to change who, hold, who held power, and I was going to figure it out and, and make sure that the person who was wielding that pen was putting workers into the union, not taking them out. So that was my story. Adam, I think it would help for you to actually tell your story as well, how you got to... <laughs> and I did press. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, a couple of elements. My background was in press communications. I was a press secretary and communications director for various campaigns, including the New Jersey Democratic Party, um, <laughs> but also <laughs> Oregon, and South Dakota, and a bunch, a bunch of places like that. And the kind of key defining moment of my kind of political thinking, and so, a few of you heard this before um, at the polling session yesterday, was a year I spent in, in South Dakota. 
Um, it was right after uh, t- 2000, you know, right after 9-11, it was uh, a state that George W. Bush had won by 20 points, and it was the number one Senate race that year, U.S. Senate. And uh, this is a year that Max Cleland lost in Georgia, the war hero. Jean Shaheen lost in New Hampshire. Luckily, she came back and won later. Uh, Democrats lost the Senate majority that year. And we ended up winning in South Dakota by 524 votes. And the way that we did it was uh, you know, there was a big ag corporation that came into the state and attacked the senator I was working for for a provision of the farm bill he was authoring that would basically protect little guy family farmers from having their farms taken over by big ag corporations. And uh, when we, you know, we were kind of in paralysis for a day when they took out full page newspaper ads in every single newspaper across the state, these big corporations. And the senator decided you know, not to reverse course and flip flop, but rather to fight back and hope for the best. And when we did, there was this key moment where these farmers and ranchers uh, drove to our, our press conference at the Sioux Falls Public Library, drove from about four hours away to be there. This guy gets up to the podium and he says, look around this room. Look at all these people in cowboy hats. Pretty much every one of us is a Republican. And we're standing with Democrat Tim Johnson because he's fighting for our economic interests. He's fighting for our family farms. And these are people who are pro-life, pro-gun, church-going, culturally conservative people who are willing to support a socially progressive Democrat because economic popular, populism issues were front and center that year. And a key takeaway for me was, wow, we don't have to compromise our values, but it is a matter of agenda setting and deciding how robust we will be as we stand up for everyday people um, against powerful interests, particularly on economic issues, but also on issues um, you know, like, like systemic racism, uh, truly challenging power on behalf of regular people uh, and showing people that they, that they can come to the polls uh, inspired by someone, not just being dragged there. So a couple years later when I was at the New Jersey Democratic Party, I remember the Progressive Caucus um, that came to our convention was kind of scoffed at in some of, some of the halls of the Democratic Party. And I was like, Why, what's, what's up with this? And it was only later in 2004 after we lost the presidential race, and I had worked in Oregon for a while for Kerry, uh, and there was this really vibrant debate happening where somebody would write in Mother Jones and somebody would answer in The Nation, and somebody would answer in um, The American Prospect about the direction of our party and some people were talk, calling for the DLC, corporate Democrat model. And there was an article by a guy named David Sirota. Uh, th- this was right when the Da Vinci Code was popular. And it was called um, The Democratic Da Vinci Code, Wh- Why Economic Populism is the Key to Political Salvation for Democrats. And he pretty, pretty much shined a spotlight on a few people who had won in rural areas that Democrats never went in, including Bernie Sanders, not in Burlington, Vermont, but in the very rural, culturally conservative parts of Vermont. David Obi in Wisconsin, Brian Schweitzer in Montana, and pretty much made the case that like, but by challenging power, standing up for regular people, that is how, particularly on economic issues, that is how Democrats can win in these areas. And I was like, wow, I wanna be part of that. I wanna help build a movement for that. And I actually turned down a couple establishment jobs that would've kind of put me on the short list for Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign a couple years later and took a three month contract with moveon.org. Um, and that's where I worked with Stephanie for the first time. And when we were there, we were actually on a trail during a retreat talking about how progressive candidates needed more support. And the idea of the future we'll see was talked about then, and several months later we made it happen. So that's a little bit of our backgrounds. So to answer the question, who asked the question about support in red districts and what we need to do to get support in red districts? So, I mean, I, I think that, that our backgrounds are important for understanding why you know, we embrace economic populism and because we've seen it work. We've seen it work in South Dakota. We've seen it work in West Virginia. Um, we, as an organization, do ongoing polling and spend a lot of time out in the states and can see that um, you know, e- economic populism is... Uh, so, so, so strongly supported among rural voters, um, urban voters. You know, it's about, as Bernie Sanders would say, creating an interracial revolution around shared class interests. Um, you know, to add on to Adam's story in South Dakota and what he saw working there, um, you know, in West Virginia when I was organizing, um, I talked about this hospital that I organized wall to wall. We we had to go out on strike to get our contract. And, um, you know, this is, so we're in West Virginia, for those who don't know the geography, I mean, Ohio is about, 
a mile this way, Pennsylvania's about a mile this way. I mean, it's, it's really what I call the electoral epicenter. Um, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, all, all the workers are from that area and all meeting there. Um, and, and a lot of them are, are coming from those three states working at this particular hospital. And we went out on strike, and, um, and it was 2004. It was, it was an election year. It was Kerry versus George W. Bush. Um, and there were all these nurses driving up to the picket line in their Cadillacs with their big W stickers on the back. And they were all Bush voters, but they were there doing the most radical thing you can do in America as a healthcare worker, which is go on strike because they knew that it was good for their families, because they knew that this was the way to get affordable health care, this was the way to get higher um, wages, and this was the way to get staffing ratios which were better for their patients. They knew that this was the right thing to do, and they could feel that it would make an economic difference in their pockets, and that's why they were willing to engage in really radical political activity, even while they were voting for the guy who was not on our side. And so that's, that's uh, a guiding principle for you know, a lot of our strategic thinking is guided by you know, what we've seen from our work with folks on the ground. So, yeah. um, so just to flesh out our model in full, since it's mm -hmm. not always apparent in one email or one article or even one event like this, mm -hmm. um, you know, we really span hopefully the entire pipeline of one's political career, ranging from the nascent stages of one's candidacy all the way through the uh, high watermark achievements of governing, mm -hmm. and then right back to the campaign trail again. You know, at, at our core, we work very closely on the coordinated side of campaigns, by and large, with candidates, uh, helping to not just train, but uh, help people build a campaign, uh, find campaign managers uh, for the, the campaigns that we uh, endorse and put a lot of capacity into helping with their polling and their messaging, uh, putting people on the ground, and really kind of being their partners in the trenches as they do their campaign, piling on you know, our million members, our thousands of members in their district or state um, you know, th as volunteers or donors. And then, you know, unlike a lot of electoral groups whose job ends on election day, we really consider our job to begin on election day, um, with the entire election really being a means towards the end of governing and changing the laws in order to make life better for everyday people. And um, you know, you've, you've met uh, Sarah and Courtney from our lobbying shop. Um, you know, we're one of the few actual good guy progressive uh, lobbyists on the Hill uh, working to maintain, <laughs> maintain our relationships with the people that we elect because we don't want to say, okay, you're in there, go for it, and leave them you know, susceptible to all these structural, structural barriers and you know, kind of a rigged structural system even for elected officials, right? They kind of ask them to kind of get in line with no power base of their own. Um, so part of what we do is we really try to oftentimes spend weeks or months before doing what essentially is a product launch with our friends in Congress to put new ideas into the political mainstream. Uh, we spent months and months doing the polling and the lobbying on the issue of debt-free college before eventually convincing Chuck Schumer and Elizabeth Warren to step out together with us and a broad coalition of allies, including the Working Families Party and Move On and Demos and DFA and a bunch of others, various unions, uh, to put that into the political bloodstream. And we, through our lobbying shop and then our grassroots activism, on the issue organizing side, we worked to get 100 members of Congress signed on to this House and Senate resolution, including over half of the Senate Democratic Caucus. And this was during 2015, 2016, and our our eye the whole time was on Hillary Clinton. And I was like, yes, of course Bernie Sanders is gonna support this, right? Um, but if Hillary Clinton supports this, we have successfully moved the center of gravity in the Democratic Party and made this an uncontested space. And it took a lot of, you know, this kind of went back to our PAC side and our electoral team, like really working with, with Hillary Clinton's team to understand this issue, feel comfortable with the language of this issue. You know, when she stepped out initially for it, making sure that she got you know, the rewards of stepping out for, you know, correctly on that issue in the media with various grassroots groups. And by the end of the campaign, she was talking about debt-free college in every single debate, in her convention speech, in her paid advertising. And while she had, you know, she had five main planks on her website, some were kind of catch-all things like economic security, debt-free college had its own plank as one of the five. And that was one example. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> um, but but there's there's kind of a coda to this. Once 
we successfully moved the center of gravity with Hillary Clinton, we were then able to more easily go to a bunch of top tier Senate races, uh, including those that were endorsed by the DSEC nationally, um, you know, that might have been a little bit more prone to be risk averse, and say, hey, Hillary Clinton endorsed it, Chuck Schumer endorsed it, why don't you join us? And we were able to roll out nine US Senate candidates, including Catherine Cortez Masto and Maggie Hassan and others on the same day. We were able to roll out a bunch of House candidates on the same day. And one of the things that we're most proud of is we were able to go to our friends in the states um, and roll out 10 state legislators who were allies, some of whom we had met at our candidate trainings, uh, to join a national conference call and announce on the same day that they were going to be introducing local versions of the Schumer-Warren resolution, the shots schumer warren resolution in their legislatures. And it got so much media coverage, it was ridiculous. Uh, we had one Hawaiian legislator on the phone, uh, Kaniela Ng, who's over there. Kaniela, is Kaniela here? There we go, right over there. <laughs> um, you know, because he was on the phone, four different Hawaii newspapers wrote about that media call. I didn't even know there were four Hawaii newspapers, <laughs> but that was great. But seriously, you, you know, you all have power in helping us mainstream these ideas, right? You know, having local leaders really gave us more of a hook sometimes than just even saying a national person is supporting this. So I just want to kind of lay out our life cycle, which basically starts with building relationships with all of you, getting to know you better, building trust and partnership, getting in the trenches together, thinking together, moving into governing, and then it all rotates back to the kind of campaign issues we can see on the campaign trail, and we're working together to move our ideas into the mainstream. So that's a big part of our model, and it undergird, undergird some of the answers that we'll talk about in terms of what we look for in endorsements and how we approach to, um, working with candidates on the campaign trail. Well, and I would just add to that, we see policy and politics as completely intertwined. And this is something that re the Republicans do so well. During the health care fight in 2009, they really, they married together their narrative around health care and death panels and organizing against the health care bill and turned that into electoral victories. Um, and what so many in the Democratic Party fail to understand is that relationship between policy and politics. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we see this as a hybrid model. Not only do we have to be invested in the electoral politics and electing um, more uh, people who are intuitively and in their gut on the side of people and not corporations, um, but then in power, we have to execute on those policies and embrace those policies that create a more expansive vision of what government can and should be, and push the envelope and create a larger Overton window. So we're, our position should not just be, they want to cut Social Security, we don't want to cut Social Security. Our, our position needs to be, they want to cut Social Security, we want to expand Social Security. Um, so with that said, let's, let's start getting into this bucket where I think a lot of questions um, relate to, which is the endorsement process, what we're looking for, how we're evaluating campaigns when we get deeply involved. Um, so um, our, in our endorsement process, we're looking at three factors. Um, we're looking at, um, are you a bold progressive? Uh, competency and viability. Um, are you a bold progressive? What does that mean to us? Because I think we all get asked this question a lot about what makes a progressive. Um, like I said, I, I think to us, it's do you have that moral compass in terms of being uh, on the side of people and getting, like really getting regular people and working people and what, you know, can you speak authentically to, and do you understand the experience of, uh, being a working person who's struggling to get by and staying up late at night worrying about if you're gonna pay your heating bill or pay for your kids' braces or how you're gonna find uh, affordable daycare um, or whether you've got enough milk in the fridge. I mean, do, do you get that? You know, Those are the kind of people that we're looking for and then we're also looking for organizers. Are you committed to, when you hold power, doing something with it? Are you going to go out there every day? Are you going to be the person on the floor of your state legislator or at your city council or on the halls of Congress who's circulating the letter and passing the resolutions and really organizing your colleagues to get something done? Um, so those are the kinds of people that we're really trying to, to formally endorse and, and invest in. Um, you know, We think you are all those kind of people. That's why you're here, right? Um, but then we also look at a couple other factors. We look at um, 
competency. Um, you know, are you committed to running a best practices campaign? Are you open to feedback? Um, we look at things like, are you getting up on time? Are you making the call time? Uh, are you getting out there and talking to the voters and kissing the babies? Um, looking at all sorts of uh, factors around that. And then, um, and then viability. You know, do we have a path to, do we believe that there's a path to victory? Um, it's always a tension because we, uh, we want everyone to, to run everywhere and we want to be competitive everywhere and we think we should challenge the Republicans everywhere or the corporate Democrats everywhere. Um, but we also have to be mindful for us organizationally of our own resources. You know, we are funded by our members, uh, our million members. We, we're very aware that a lot of them are on fixed incomes, are on social security. We get notes all the time that say, you know, money is so tight but I'm giving $3 to this candidate because you told me they can win, and I believe you, and I believe that they're gonna make a difference when they get power, and we take that so seriously, and we take very seriously our commitment to make sure that their money is well spent and is a good investment. And so while we wanna encourage everybody to run everywhere for every race, um, we also have to make sometimes really difficult decisions when we're deciding which of our organizational resources to invest more heavily in a, in a campaign. So, <laughs> yeah, so those are, those are our criteria of, uh, for endorsement. So let's keep going about like what our model of candidate support has looked like, mm -hmm. and then a little bit about right. where we aspire it to go. Yeah. Um, so you know, as I mentioned, we, we work on the coordinated side, not independent side, right? There are some places where you get their endorsement, they're you know, they legally will not talk to you, and they do stuff over here, f you know, hopefully for your benefit. Um, because we really care about the life cycle of one's political career and leadership um, and our partnership with bold progressive heroes who are electing you know, local, state, and federally, uh, the campaign and getting a chance to work with people directly on the campaign is key to that, that model. Um, so let me start first with the federal level since that's where we kind of started in the 2010 cycle and 2012 cycle before moving more and more into the state area and local area in 2014 and 2016. So you know, the high watermark of our online fundraising so far has been for Elizabeth Warren, uh, raising her over a million dollars uh, through hundreds of thousands of grassroots donations in the 2012, 2011, 2012 cycle. Uh, that also included running the draft Elizabeth Warren for Senate campaign. Uh, typically for Senate uh, candidates, we've raised you know, between you know, 50,000 and a couple hundred thousand, depending on who they were and how early we, we endorsed, uh, but also what kind of story we were able to tell about, about their race. Right, the person who challenged Paul Ryan uh, in the year where the Paul Ryan budget entered the national uh, consciousness. Uh, we were able to raise uh, Rob Zerban a lot of money. Um, we were also gen able to generate a lot of phone calls from around the country because people were really paying attention to that race. Uh, one thing that's really cool about being able to work with people in the nascency of their, of their political careers uh, is that we can think with you about how to build a story uh, locally and nationally for what you're doing over time, including how can we tell a story of 10 legislators or candidates stepping up at the same moment. So it's not about any one individual, but it's about a movement of, of awesome progressive candidates or elected officials stepping forward together and being the tail that wags the dog of the Democratic Party, right? It's a, we're able to build sometimes a story out of the collective more than an individual. Um, and uh, you know, our members who are besieged with fundraising emails and besieged with various requests from candidates uh, really respect being able to buy into a larger story, not just having to understand what every single uh, campaign they're hearing about um, you know, m means. So um, typically for these federal candidates, we will you know, jump, have somebody from our team jump on their weekly consultant calls. Uh, we really try to keep our, you know, we're at our best when we kind of keep our ear to the ground and be fully in the loop on the ebb and flow of a campaign, right? It might be kind of ho-hum for a campaign to decide to announce that they're launching two more offices in various parts of their district. But when we hear that, we think, oh, we can send an email you know, to a 20 mile radius of that office and get a bunch of our members to go there. And if they actually show up and meet the candidate, they'll be much more likely to take volunteer action or donation action later. So it's, it's a win-win to be privy to that information. Um, if an opponent is attacking or a special interest group is attacking and we hear that and can connect it to a national narrative that our members are in touch with, that's a way for us to shine the spotlight on that uh, campaign uh, in a very limited window that might close in a couple days. 
um, when Karl Rove's group decided to attack Elizabeth Warren and air TV ads against her, we were able to raise her about $100,000 in a couple days because people were so pissed off about that, right? Mm -hmm. If for some reason we were not aware of that fact and we learned about it a couple weeks later, that moment would have been gone, right? We don't have a magic money button. We try to be smart campaigners and connect with our members where they are, and basically it's a two-way street of figuring out how to build systems with campaigns we're involved in to keep our ear to the ground, keep ourselves in, in the ebb and flow. And the more involved we are, the more we set up structures for clear communication, the more we can do our best for candidates. Um, would you want to add some stuff to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's worth going through a little bit more of our, um, you know, just logistically how we're supporting candidates. Um, so we're, um, we ask ourselves a question frequently, how do we elect 300 more Elizabeth Warrens? There happen to be 300 candidates in this room, so. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> um, but one of the, the answers that we quickly realized was that we needed to be able to provide scaled support. We needed to be able to support hundreds, maybe thousands of candidates at once. And so um, I just wanna walk through a little bit of our process. Um, so we have a questionnaire for anyone who's seeking our endorsement. Uh, it's online, many of you have filled it out. Um, but if you're looking for our endorsement questionnaire, you can find it on the website. Just click the link that says, are you running for office? And you'll see a link to the endorsement questionnaire. Um, for, for candidates that we want to support and invest in, um, our scaled activities include things like this training. Um, and not just this training, we also have done trainings. We've done trainings this year in New Jersey, in North Carolina, in Virginia. Woohoo! Uh, we are going to do a lot more uh, strategic, strategic geographical trainings as well. We'll do online trainings throughout the year um, where we're really investing. The reason this training is so much about the nuts and bolts is because we really want to make sure that uh, as you leave here, you feel empowered um, because you've already done through exercises a lot of these skills. You feel like you can do them for yourselves. And so that's very much the ethos um, to empower people to go out and go home and put into practice what they've learned. Um, we also, obviously, our technology, PIES, is another part of our ongoing support model. Um, and then um, as we get deeper and go further um, for the races that uh, we're, we're going deeper with, we have fundraising, um, obviously from our million members. We're really lucky to have such a strong and supportive small dollar donor base. Um, we've now raised about 23 million in the last eight years for candidates and campaigns and small dollar donations. And, uh, our members are great. Um, and we plug in our million members as volunteers. So we, every election, we have a call program where we allow our members to get together and have call parties or to just call in and be part of uh, remote phone programs so that they're calling for different candidates. We tend to make about between three and four million calls to voters every cycle during the last month before election day. Um, or, you know, in the last four days, we tend to be making you know, as many as 500,000 500, calls in those last days, and we'll have several hundred volunteers on the line at once. Um, and then we have um, experts on our team who many of, you've met many of them this, this weekend, um, who stay in touch with candidates, can be strategic, give strategic advice, be sounding boards, um, and maintain that relationship. In addition, we also have uh, cross-candidate campaigns, which I think I would actually like Adam to talk about because he's been one of the driving forces on our team for those. Sure, so this is one of the areas where um, you know, there's, there's some places that are harder to think about, like how do we build this aspirational part of our program and our partnership with all these amazing people? And then there's some easier ones, some low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. This is one of low-hanging fruits. So similar to that conference call with legislators about DEFRI College, um, you know, one thing that we find is that sometimes it's very hard for an individual candidate to get press coverage on an idea. It's like, great, you're a candidate and you have an idea. Why is that newsworthy? I'm not going to cover you, right? Uh, particularly if you're in an area where uh, there are multiple legislative districts in a media market, it's hard sometimes for a reporter to justify covering one candidate over and over again, even if that's clearly the most vibrant candidate doing the most active campaigning. Um, so one thing that we've come up with is this idea of cross-candidate issue campaignings, which again, is people putting their uh, you know, collective progressivity <laughs> and candidacies together to have something where the whole is greater than some of its parts. Right? We, became, we become the tail that wags the dog of the Democratic Party. This can operate within a state, 
So if there's a bunch of legislative districts and not one, but three or four or five candidates step out together on the same day, they all get press coverage. Everybody's winning, right? Um, you know, we love to put together things that are national in scope, pretty much create template t press releases, template frequently asked questions and how to answer those if reporters asked, um, et cetera, and you know, scale it, send it to all of you and anybody who wants to opt in, opts in. Um, and it's on, it can be on a bunch of different issues. So if we're doing our job right, we are kind of doing that as many times as possible. And again, keeping open lines of communication with you so, so that you, know, you can avail yourselves, you can kind of jump on that ship. You know, the added benefit is that we can often get national press coverage on this stuff, whereas you know, even con congressional races oftentimes don't get national coverage. So we were once working on a New Mexico race um, where the campaign swore to us that like, the local stations just do not cover politics. They do not cover house races. Well, when we had several candidates in town, we did a petition delivery to Paul Ryan's office against his budget. We had a bunch of top progressive candidates leading the charge, and CNN followed them all the way down the hallway, and did CNN and MSNBC both did uh, stories on these candidates. And then we sent it to the local markets, and we kind of shamed the local ABC affiliate into actually doing a story. <laughs> And the local ABC affiliate actually ran portions of the CNN ad or CNN story in their coverage. So again, so that's again one of the easier ones. And just stay tuned. And if you ever have any ideas of like, hey, this issue is popping up, our guess is my guess is that other candidates also would like to campaign on this. I'm having trouble getting traction. Can you help? The answer is yes. Please send it to us. Resend it to us. Make sure some, you, you get an answer because we really want to you know lean into that opportunity. I do want to give one more shout out to pies, um, if I could. Um, I'm a layman's when it comes to, to pies. Stacy knows way more about it than, oh, sorry. Stephanie, <laughs> Stacy also knows a lot about it. Stacy, is there a Stacy here? <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> Stephanie <laughs> you must meet this Stacy. She's amazing. Uh, <laughs> now, you know, like the national candidate training, pies is something that came out of Stephanie's head, but I want to give my layman's version of why it's so important. You know, I've called it the TurboTax of campaigns. We're basically, you know, as someone who also can't do my own taxes without TurboTax, you know, it basically walks me through every step of the way on things like calculating a win number, et cetera, and just saves a ton of time. You know, after our last, you know, our last candidate training, we had um, uh, Maria Chappelle Nadal, the uh, state senator from Ferguson, Missouri, um, doing a panel with us um, called How Candidates Can Show Solidarity with Movements, including Black Lives Matter. We had her, we had Planned Parenthood, we had a couple others who were in the thick of the fight and talking about how candidates can use their bully pulpit to show support. And she called a few weeks after national candidate training and she said, hey, I just use the guides on pies. It's not one of the fancy tech things, it's just like PDFs that you can download and there's questions that you can, such as, what do I ask people who are applying for finance director on my campaign? And she's like, I've been hiring finance directors for years I have never known the right questions to ask. I wish I've had this for the last several years. It made my life so easy. And there are tons of those guides that Stephanie and our team have just worked so hard to do. And it's almost malpractice to not take the time to really acquaint yourself. My, my analogy there would be you know, saying, oh, I don't have time to learn how to use Google Maps and therefore looking at a map and writing directions for yourself. Save yourself time by taking an hour or two and just digging into pies because it will save you so much time and so much money. Don't let yourself forfeit that opportunity <laughs> to benefit yourself. So that's my layman's version of pitching pies. <laughs> Is that okay, Stacy? <laughs> well, we should clearly talk more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so going from that, I actually want to talk for a minute to answer the question, uh, funding progressive campaigns, how to fund progressive campaigns. Who, someone over here, yes. Um, so, you know, obviously we've raised a lot of money um, for candidates and campaigns, and a lot of people often ask us, you know, how do you do it? Um, there is no magic uh, button that you press to make money come out of the internet. Um, there is, you don't just get to turn on the faucet and the money comes out. Um, but I think the principles for raising money online are the same for raising money at any time. And so I just want to kind of talk a little bit about our approach, um, because you you may find it helpful, and that is um, we are always very, very clear with our members about um, 
why strategic, why, what our rationale is for strategically doing the thing that we're doing, whether it's uh, supporting a candidate, whether it's lobbying, whether it's signing a petition. Um, we always have a reason for it. We never ever, even if we know that lots of people are gonna sign a petition to the Supreme Court saying be better, like the Supreme Court's not gonna listen. So we're, we're not gonna send out that petition. Um, we always have a theory for why we're doing what we're doing and why we're asking our members to do what we're asking them to do. And, um, and we're very upfront about that, very clear about that, and then we report back. And so like Adam was telling the story about the candidate, Rob Zerbon, who um, you know, delivered the petitions to Paul Ryan's office and then raised a whole bunch of money off that. You know, if you can show at every step of the way with your campaigns and not tell, if, they can, if people can see you moving the ball forward on progressive issues and being an organizer and an activist in the course of your campaign for the issues that matter and that you're campaigning on, they will reward you and they will pay you back um, with that. And so I just wanna, I, I hope that that's a little bit helpful in talking about how we fund progressive campaigns because there is a huge opportunity in building a strong small dollar donor base um, because people will get involved, they just want to be taken along for the ride. Yes. <laughs> um, so there was something you said that I wanted to pivot off of. I don't remember, okay. So um, in terms of the, the I want to, pick up on the idea of what resources do we have presently and what are our aspirational resources. Mm -hmm. So you know, one thing that we'd like to kind of add to the mix this cycle a little bit more is helping candidates navigate the consultant class, the consultant uh, culture, um, and possibly add some guides to pies that help, that help do that. You know, one thing, uh, we were talking to someone who's kind of in the loop with how the John Ossoff race went down and you know, something as simple as how that campaign constructed their contract with their digital firm uh, has huge impact, both in terms of how much money that campaign receives and the voice that it projects to its most um, fervent supporters. So in that case, you know, the contract was signed at a time when it was never really foreseen that it would just go gangbusters and become kind of this viral sensation raising, you know, 20, 30 million dollars online, right? If we were advising them how to construct a contract, we probably would have, would have said, sure, in the interest of paying people fairly, have some percent of what you raise online go to the firm up to this amount, but then have kind of a sliding scale where that percent goes down over time, right? Like the percent that the consultants get between one million and two million shouldn't be the same percent that they get between zero and 100,000, right? And certainly between 10 and 20 million, it should be pretty low. Um, so, you know, millions of dollars basically went to to the consultants that otherwise could have gone to the campaign because of this simple contract term. So that's like you know, an easy rationale for why we would wanna help candidates navigate some of these waters and create a scaled way of doing it. So probably recommending template contract language to use as opposed to trying to look at you know, 300 contracts times however many consultants. But the second thing that I really wanna kind of hold out there and just you know, evangelize for, for a second is keeping your authentic voice. We have heard so many authentic voices, beautiful stories, beautiful frames of looking at the world, um, during the course of these four days. And you know, if you get as many emails as I do, very rare is it that you see um, authentic voices coming across in the way that people engage their own supporters over email. Well, part of the reason for that is how these contracts are written and the incentives that are baked into the cake, right? So if the only incentive that they have is to raise money, then they will just pelt the list as often as possible, throwing whatever shabby emails at the door that they have to to raise a little bit more money. Um, either for their own portion of the money or if, the, if you're judging their success only by money. Um, but one thing that we advise all candidates is videotape every single speech you make, right? You might not use nine out of 10 videos, but every once in a while, you will accidentally say something in a truly magical way that you will never be able to repeat <laughs> again. And you will want that, you know. We love Elizabeth Warren, so I'll use her as a point of reference. You know, before she decided to run, when she was at a, at a house party that nobody you know, that, that she, I don't even think she knew it was being videotaped by one of her supporters. That's where she had that now iconic speech where she said, nobody gets rich on their own, right? If you get rich, good for you. Keep a big chunk of it, but pay a chunk of it forward for the next person so they have a chance in life, right? And that had viral appeal. Millions of people saw it. That fueled a ton of fundraising. We were able to later fundraise a lot for her because of that. And that just became part of the image of her campaign, right? Um, so, I. Uh, you know, very rarely do candidates, even Bernie, honestly, send 
magical moments to their supporters to keep them involved in the campaigns. So that's one example of how just constructing something like a contract can actually lead to an incentive for your own people or consultants to make sure your authenticity, authenticity stays intact. So we'd like to move more into that space. Um, you know, on the cross-candidate issue campaigns, it does not really require an endorsement to participate. That's something like this training where if you're a bold progressive and you wanna opt in, we wanna have you. So it, th that's something where, you know, that's one of the easy ones. Um, how can we, you know, in terms of some follow-up steps, follow-up trainings and stuff like that. Um, you know, there have been a couple people over the course of this weekend who have basically asked us, hey, can we do a version of this training locally, right? I will tell you that the hardest part of putting together a training like this isn't the actual training itself, although we all have worked very hard these last four days. Um, the hardest part is the months and months and months of work that goes into making sure that we have the right people in the room, right? Yeah. And therefore, what we'll probably be doing in upcoming weeks is putting together essentially a, re a request for proposal, an RFP, <laughs> to some of you saying, hey, would you be interested in working with us to have a localized version of this training? If so, what local coalition partners can you organize to help get the right people in the room, right? If you can, if we can essentially, if you can be the guarantor <laughs> that we can show up and have the right people in the room, and I will give a shout out to New Jersey and Wynn in particular, and the WFP in particular, who work together to fill our New Jersey training. Um, you know, it's really a model. Um, then it, it makes it easier for us. There's also some logistical challenges and we work with you on that. Um, so I do wanna take this opportunity to also introduce um, Maria again, Maria Langholtz right there. Uh, she will be, actually you can clap harder after you hear what, what, what she will be. She will be the main point of contact leaving this training for all of you who have questions. So isn't that awesome? We have a point of contact for you. <laughs> so. um, she likes emails late at night. She likes them early in the morning. <laughs> um, lots and lots of follow-up emails. But the, the email address that we're setting up that will be part, that will then, you know, that will go to Maria and a team of people is? Campaigns at boldprogressives.org. Campaigns at boldprogressives.org. Um, we definitely, um, you know, we need to prioritize internally. In some cases, we'll be able to go with the flow. In some cases, we won't. But we definitely want to have, again, structures set up where we can maintain communication with you, consider incoming requests, look for the win-win propositions, and act on those that are. Well, and, and just to add to that, because I know a couple people asked some questions about uh, how we're building the bench, how we're looking at 2020 and redistricting, um, questions in that vein. Um, I mean, this is part of it. We need to run thousands of candidates. We need to be competitive in so many races so we can take back the state legislatures um, so that we can control the redistricting process um, and so that we can keep building power and building from the ground up. And so, you know, one thing we would ask you to do is to please think about becoming partners with us in this project, going back to your communities, um, getting more candidates that you know into the pipeline, bringing more folks, either organizing a training, you know, in your state or bringing, you know, five people with you to the next national candidate training, making sure people know about the technology that we can offer them, getting our guides and resources and our running for office guide into their hands, flagging for us when there's races in your area that need support, um, just to please be partners with us as we go out and compete everywhere so that we can take back the state legislatures um, because it's so important and we need to be building the state and local power so badly. And that reminded me of the point I forgot before, um, which was being partners with us. So um, again, it's, it's hard to keep our ear on the ground for 300 different races, right? Um, you know, the thing that we have found uh, that allows us to kind of connect with our members when it comes to state and local fights is when there's state and local fights that tap into a national narrative, right? So our, mem our members were all in for the Wisconsin moment, right? When Scott Walker took on unions and there were recalls, like, you know, they heard about it on MSNBC all the time. Like, that was a great, that was a great place for us to engage, and we're happy to be on the front lines with unions and others on the ground, you know, fighting back for workers. Um, if there are things happening in your state legislature or on the campaign trail that's resonant in the state that you see a connection, a clear connection with a national issue, right, at the same time that um, Republicans nationally are trying to cut Medicaid benefits, uh, there's something in your state where Republicans are trying to do the same thing, 
throwing nominations to us for things that we could think about as part of our national storyline are really helpful. If it's you know, a local waterworks project that is very popular locally, but it will be very hard for us to connect nationally, you know, we might have to take a pass. That said, we're about to get more and more into the infrastructure jobs fight, so maybe it will be very relevant, right? Um, if there's, honestly, if there's, a, if there's a bridge collapse in your state um, that is not making national news, but that you're aware of, that's the kind of thing where we would actually love to be working to plan local press conferences with local leaders talking about you know, connecting the dots between that and the need for more infrastructure and jobs in our communities, right? So anyway, just, just know that it's a two-way street. Know that you know, while we want to be the glue behind the scenes on cross-candidate campaigns, some of the ideas will come from you and some individual fights that we highlight will come from you. So please keep the ideas coming mm -hmm. to Maria at campaigns <laughs> at boldprogressives.org. So we are getting frantic wrap it up signs from the team back there. Uh, so I know we want to get you to your next trainings. Are we headed straight into the next round of trainings? Yeah. Right here, okay. Um, but thank you again for being here. That, oh. oh, we're closing down now? Okay. We, we, I know that we didn't get a chance to answer all the questions, so feel, what, what? <laughs> Wait, would you like to say something? No, no, we're good. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. We <laughs>